Well, welcome to the South Concourse of McLean Stadium. A day earlier this week. You can blame a Thursday game for that one, right, John? Yes, yeah. A lot of things different this week. A lot of things <laughs> different. The voice of the Bears, John Morris. I am Sports Director Curtis Quinlan at 6 News, and this is the Big 12 Breakdown for, I believe it's week 7 of the college football season. How, how about that? Week 7. I feel like I blinked. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Boy, that's the way it is. When you get into it, when the season start, starts, it just rolls, doesn't yeah. it? And here we are. This will be game 6 for Baylor this week, and that's the halfway point of the regular season. It is. I feel like the next time I, I feel like I'll blink after I leave Morgantown Thursday night, and the next thing I know, we'll be at some bowl game somewhere yeah, exactly. in December. <laughs> um, it's week seven, so I want to start with the same way we always do with the recap. We can go through scores, or we can go through thoughts of the game. Okay. I'm going to start with the two 11 a.m. kicks, okay. and I'm going to stay. I don't want to use the B word, but Texas 49, Oklahoma, nothing makes you want to use the B word with Texas. I'm telling you, they were hitting on all cylinders and they took advantage of, you know, a, a, a uh, wounded animal in yes, Oklahoma because Dylan much. Gabriel didn't play. So factor that in. But would Dylan Gabriel have been the difference in making up 49 points? I don't think so. Uh, he didn't play defense either. Right. So how about that? I mean, really impressive win by Texas. Quinn Ewers is back. Yeah. Uh, he plays in this game, and he's electric. There's yeah. a reason why he, they bring him back from injury. Hudson Card is playing well, and they still go with Quinn Ewers at QB. It's because of the difference he makes in the offense. 49 points against a little bit of a wounded, uh, wounded animal right. in the Oklahoma defense especially. Yeah, and he looked good. I mean, coming back, what was it, four weeks he was out? Yeah. Three or four weeks he was out and stepped right back in and looked like he hadn't missed a beat from when he played against uh, Alabama. Right. He was injured in the second quarter in week two. Yeah. And then, yeah, missed, week, missed this, the second half of that game, week three, week four, week five. Yeah, that's and, it. And yeah. week six. And, or, and no, it came back in week six. <laughs> right. You get the point. The other 11 a.m. game that I think we can glean more from, TCU 38. Kansas 31, college game day in Lawrence. TCU on the just uh, on the cusp of the top 10 right now. Yeah. And Kansas staying put at number 19. Kansas fans, to me, have a right to be very upset about the last play of the game. I think there were a couple of hold, defensive holdings that no flag was thrown. Sure. Two that I saw in the frame as Jason Bean is throwing the ball. <laughs> but Jason Bean coming in for an injured Jalen Daniels and not letting up. That was not the same Jason Bean you and I saw last year in Lawrence. Yeah, no, really impressive for him to be ready and to step into that position in that game with all the magnitude, you know, really yeah. for KU in that game, for him to be prepared and step in and play as well as he did. I mean, that was really, really good. I mean, that was two good teams. I right. mean, uh, you, however you slice it, those were two top 20 teams duking it out against each other and TCU just got the better of Kansas. Which 5-0? is more impressive to you 2022 TCU or 2019 Baylor Ooh, good thought um, you know I'm closer to Baylor obviously and I remember those games and they were they were you know climbing as the season went on and got better as the season went on um, and Baylor was picked what that year what do you think in 19 oh in 19 had to I mean, been low middle of the yeah. pack to low probably I want to say fourth or fifth or sixth. yeah that might be right but then look at TCU, they weren't picked very highly this year. Right. And uh, how they've done, you know, a big win over Oklahoma, follow that up with a win over Kansas. So and Neither one really tested in the non-conference slate. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, both of them, 5-0 is 5-0, isn't yeah. it? You don't ask how, you ask how many. <laughs> That's right. Um, how about the comeback for the ages? Not that I'm biased or anything. In Stillwater, <laughs> Oklahoma on Saturday with number seven, Oklahoma State 41, Texas Tech 31. John, when I tell you that I've never been so happy to see a flag yeah. on a field yeah. in all of my life <laughs> as on that kickoff, uh, Baron Morton, a redshirt freshman in his first career start was absolutely magnificent for Joey McGuire's bunch. Yeah, and where did that come from? I mean, just kind of right. out of the blue, right? Uh, and look at Tech, I mean, taking their – Winning ways on the road, playing in that atmosphere. Yeah. Really impressive by Tech, but Oklahoma State, give them credit. They did what they had to do to get a win. Back-to-back -back weeks, pushing ranked Big 12 contenders yeah. to the brink on the road. Yeah. They take Kansas State down to the wire, lose by 9. They take Oklahoma State down to the wire, lose by 10. And that Oklahoma State team was trailing going into the fourth quarter, needed a good fourth quarter uh, to be able to pull off the win. Um, I'm impressed with what I see from Texas Tech. 
but you also have to give Oklahoma State credit for finding a way to get it done in the end. Yeah, absolutely. And where I think we've said this before, or I've said this before, but where's that transition year? You know, when you change right. coaches and you change coaching staffs, there's supposed to be a transition year in there where you got to, you know, you got to get your people in, you got to get everybody on the same page. You got to right. know where all the light switches are, you know? <laughs> but look at what uh, Joey McGuire, McGuire is doing his first year. It's just tremendous. The three Big 12 schools that are in there either actual first year or their true first year right, if you right. factor in the fact that Leipold didn't get to Lawrence until right. June one and a half of 2021 <laughs> uh five and one three and three yeah and then you have uh TCU is five and oh yeah and nearing the top 10 what the heck is happening <laughs> exactly uh I think that says those are really good coaches who know what they're doing and they just sort of translated and transferred what they were doing at other places to their new schools and man they are going great now Texas Tech going into the teeth of its schedule a little bit you've got yes West Virginia Iowa State still left those two the only Big 12 schools to not win a conference game yet um but then you look at the rest of the schedule and it's they have Oklahoma they have uh, Kansas, they have TCU, they yeah. have Baylor, and I if I feel for Joey McGuire whenever you look <laughs> yeah. at that, that, that game, that schedule that they have left. It's kind of life in the Big 12. I mean, yeah. you're going to play everybody at some point during the season, and uh, yeah, that's a gauntlet for sure, but everybody goes through it at some yeah. point in the season. You have to figure that Tech should be favored against West Virginia and Iowa State, or if not, it's a coin flip type game, you know, within three in the, in the projections. Do you think that Texas Tech can find someone and kind of surprise them in those other four? Yes, I do. I, I think they will uh, just because I think they've got the right attitude. I know Coach McGuire will have them up every mm -hmm. game and prepared every game. So, uh, yeah, I really do. I, I, I think they'll find a way. They'll be bowling at the end of the year. Yeah. So pretty wild to think about. Insane to think about. Yeah. And then the nightcap, the highest scoring affair in the Big 12 this weekend. <laughs> yes, I'm being sarcastic. It was Kansas State 10, <laughs> Iowa State 9. Did you watch every play of that I game? I didn't watch a second of it. <laughs> um, I watched a and Bama. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I am a Big 12 guy. Yeah. I cover the Big 12 at my job at 6 News. I cover the Big I do a podcast about the Big 12 because I was raised in Big 12 country. I went to a Big 12 school away from my job at 6 News. And I do this show with you. Yes. And <laughs> Did not watch the night game in the Big 12. Right. How about this? Uh, my wife wanted to watch A&M in Alabama. So our son has a master's degree from A&M. So he's got a little bit there. And, and in her family, there are Aggies. And she knew that game. Number one, she knew that game was going on. Yeah. She knew Alabama was yeah. playing A&M. And she said, let's watch that. And I said, all right, sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> my wife called me at one point Saturday night and said, what are you doing? I said, watching the Aggies lose. <laughs> Just barely. One of my best friends is a, is a diehard Aggie. He was raised in he went to school there. He covered AM for three years. Uh, he's he works. Uh, he, he does game day work for the for the AM football program yep. now on Saturdays. Nice. Loves bleeds maroon. Yeah. And I I made I, I just texted him and apologized with the way that they lost. I said, oh my God, they're getting your hopes up. And he goes, this is the worst part. It's the hope of the kills. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, that play call at the end of that one, and it blew everyone's mind. And it comes back to a Kansas State, Iowa State. Which one would you rather watch, 28-24 or 10-9? Right. Nobody watched this game. If you're a football fan in the state of Iowa on Saturday, I'm just sorry. <laughs> the two FBS programs in the state of Iowa combined for 15 points. <laughs> Is that right? On Saturday. 15 points. Because a Iowa lost to Illinois 9-6. to six. Golly. A lot of defense being played there. A lot of defense being played there and potentially bad offense. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Iowa State's defense, I was looking at the Big 12 stats earlier today, in fact, and they're number one in the league in total defense, yeah. in rush defense, I think pass defense, and I know scoring defense. So yes. pretty much every defensive category. I'm not positive about pass defense, but, man, Iowa State, they're getting it done there if they could just score some points. You have to remember that back to that Baylor-Iowa State game, Iowa State goes into it as the number one rushing defense in the Big 12, right. where they still are. Yeah. And they forced Blake Shapin to throw it, and that's when we learned Drake Dabney's going to be trying out for the Baylor track team in the spring. <laughs> um, but, you know, Baylor found a way in that one. Uh, teams are finding a way against Iowa State. That's not a knock on Matt Campbell. Brees Hall is gone. Brock Purdy is gone. Xavier Hutchinson's really the only one who had any significant playing time that's left on this yeah. Iowa State offense. Yeah, so many big guys. Uh, Charlie Kohler is gone. Remember right. how good he was, the big tight end. Uh, but, I mean, look at what they're doing. They're going to beat somebody. I mean, they're yeah. just going to get in a defensive game, and that's their forte, and they're going to beat somebody. And 
to Iowa State's credit, those first three conference games that they've had, Baylor, right. Kansas, Kansas State. <laughs> Not an easy way to Not start easy. conference play <laughs> Exactly. At all. And they've been in all three of them. They have been. 14-11 yeah. was the close one, yeah. and you had your opportunities in yeah. that one. So lots to, th- lots to be positive about for Iowa State. It's just when you look at the rest of this schedule, you still have Texas, you still have TCU, you still have both Oklahoma schools. West Virginia is probably the easiest game on their schedule, mm-hmm. and West Virginia's ranking in the top half in some of these computer projections in the FBS, yeah. and that's just speaking to the depth of the Big 12 this season. Yeah, I read something this week. Tell me if you saw this. Um, I can't remember who it was, but pretty prominent, said the Big 12 is the best conference, top to bottom, of any league in the country. May not have a playoff school, but top to bottom, it's the best league. And I don't disagree with that one bit. I don't disagree with that, and that does bring me into the next thing that I want to talk about because we are at the halfway point of the season. One through ten, is there one team that we're worried that we're worried now in week seven probably will miss a bowl game? and will be done Ooh, yeah. on Black Friday or yeah. th- uh, Thanksgiving Saturday this year. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's, what about Oklahoma? I mean, that's yeah. a possibility. It is. Isn't that crazy to talk about? But right. that's a possibility. Three weeks ago, they were in the top ten in the nation. And rightfully so. Sure, Three absolutely. And, yeah. and, you know, not that they had played that strong of a non-conference schedule. But, right. again, they, there was a lot of expectation there for a reason. I'm worried about Oklahoma potentially missing yeah. a bowl, which would be the first time since 1998. I'm worried about West Virginia missing yeah. a bowl. I'm worried about Iowa State missing a bowl as well. Yeah, yeah. And two of those teams, you know, all of those teams came out of their non-conference schedule with a winning record. Right. Now, West Virginia did have a week two conference game mixed in there. Right. But West Virginia was 2-1 and one in non-conference with one FCS game. Oklahoma was 3-0. and oh. Iowa State was 3-0. and oh. And now we're talking about all three potentially missing a bowl game? Yeah. I mean, you get a 3-0 and start, you're halfway to bowl qualification right, right. there. But uh, but I think that's a possibility. I mean, they got work to do they to do. get to six. Now, for Oklahoma, you know, we talked about Iowa State start to Big 12 play on the mm-hmm. schedule. Oklahoma's is about equally difficult. <laughs> uh, Kansas State, TCU, and Texas. Texas. Yeah. So you look at Oklahoma, you have Bedlam, you have Baylor, you have Tech, you have Iowa State, West Virginia. Would you see them, based on the way the defense is playing right now, which isn't great, yeah. combined with the unknown about Dylan Gabriel, do you have them coming out of that with at least three wins? Because I don't know if I do. I don't know. Uh, and help me remember this. Last week when we were standing here, right? did I pick Oklahoma to beat Texas? I think you picked Texas. I picked Oklahoma. Oh, you did? Okay. Because I was thinking, uh, my thought was, I don't think Oklahoma's going to lose three straight. Right. Now I'm not sure when they're going to win again. You, you know, know? And now that you say that, I think you're right. I think we both thought think the same we did. thing. I think we did. So we'll fess up to that. But uh, to me, it was more, I don't see Oklahoma losing three in a row. Right. Now, how many are they going to lose in a row? Right. That bye week cannot come soon <laughs> yeah. enough yeah. Uh, for Brent Venable's squad. How much of what's happening in Norman do we attribute to the fact that Venables is a defense first guy, similar to what Matt Rule was when he came to Waco, and that that just takes a little bit of time to install that type of defense first culture and lean so heavily on your offensive coordinator and prayer that your offense stays healthy. Yeah, maybe so. That's a good point. You know, and Jeff Levy's the offensive coordinator. Um, but it's it's more like the defense, you know, you you would never think an Oklahoma right. defense would be this bad, giving up 49 and then 55 the week before to TCU. Especially now with a national championship winning defensive coordinator. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, on I don't the, know. On the flip side of that, what three teams do we think have the best shot at being at AT&T Stadium in Arlington. Ooh. We gave you three we're worried about bowl eligibility yeah, on. Yeah. Now, three, what three teams do we think have the best shot at getting one of the two spots in Arlington on December 4th? All right. Well, for me, recency bias, uh, I think Oklahoma State. I think they're the best team in the league right now. I agree with you. I think they're playing the best of any team in the league right now. And TCU would be 1A. You know, if Oklahoma State's 1, TCU would be 1A. Um, So those would be the top two for me right now. For three and four, because did a podcast with the Waco Trip guys last week, and we talked about is it Baylor or the field for that second spot? Because I think everybody kind of agrees Oklahoma State's the best team in the Big 12 right now, or at least they're playing like Mm -hmm. it. I don't know on Baylor's schedule what games not to pick Baylor in because (laughs) Baylor's just that kind of team, and this defense is normally that good. 
on the flip side of that coin, what game, you know, based on trends, I, we both picked them to beat Oklahoma State. We both pe- picked Baylor to beat BYU. Do we think Baylor has a shot at turning this thing around in the final seven games to yep. get to Arlington at the end of the season? Because last year, they turned it on in the last month of the season mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. get there. Yeah, and I think the answer to that is yes in my mind because yes. I just see the resolve in in Coach Aranda and, you know, this open date, which was kind of a half open date because you're playing, you know, on a right. Thursday. But they just put their head down and they went to work, and I am – I can't wait to see what comes out of it on Thursday night. I can't either. I think I think this will tell us a lot about the rest of the season, even if it is West Virginia. And again, not a knock on Neil Brown, not sure. a knock on West Virginia. This Big 12 is just deep this year, one through ten. And you know, to talk about you know the half open date. So we normally talk to Dave Aranda at the podium Mondays at 11:30. <laughs> right. We get players Tuesday right around dinner time, yeah. and then they play on Saturday. Guys, they kept the ske- the same schedule this week. We got Aranda on Saturday at 11:30. We got the players Sunday right. as the second window of NFL games was ending, <laughs> which would be around dinner time. Right. And they're playing on Thursday. How much, you know, routine is important? I like the fact that they're staying on routine this week. Very much so. And it's just You know, would you expect anything less from Coach Aranda? Right. (laughs) Right? I mean, here's our weekly schedule. All right, let's back it up two days. Here's Uh our weekly schedule. That's all it was. It's no big deal. We're going to do it this way. And uh, it seems like all the players that we've talked to seem like everything went really well. That's good news to hear. Let's talk a little bit about Texas because Texas, you know, with Quinn Ewers, they're 2-1, and and he left the, the one halfway through. Yeah, yeah. With Quinn Ewers, is Texas a threat to be in Arlington? Boy, they definitely are, aren't yeah. they? I mean, we should include them in the conversation. With Bijan Robinson, you start with him, and then the way Ewers is playing, like you said, uh, they got to be up there. they got to be up there. And they're playing very different styles, you know, with, with uh, Card at quarterback instead of Ewers. They were very much, okay, Bijan, go get your 100, and then after that we're, gonna, we're just going to chuck it through the air. Yeah. And we're gonna, if, if the Bijan option's not there – then somebody's open down the field yeah. because they're loading the box. Well, now with Quinn Ewers, you can open up a little bit more of a spread attack and force defenses to commit one way or the other, and, you, and you know, you've got options that are there because Ewers is such a dynamic quarterback, even with his legs. But do you worry about injuries given that they've been banged up in the quarterback room that maybe they get a little conservative in some of these games that get closed down uh, toward the end? One of which that comes to mind, Black Friday, mm-hmm. Baylor, Texas, yeah. could be for a spot in Arlington. Yeah, could very well be. How about that? Uh, and that's way down the road. And let's uh, let's put this in a vault right here and then see where things actually are. Right. You know, that week, Thanksgiving week, um, because both teams, you know, both teams, who knows, could change their fortunes, could just continue to climb, like I think Baylor will, and Texas sure could, but uh, that's the last game of the regular season, and it'll be interesting to see where they are at that point. The the one team that we left out that we both said would be in that top three competing for a spot in Arlington at the beginning of the season is undefeated in Big 12 play. Yeah. The Kansas State K-State, Wildcats. Right. Adrian Martinez is lightning in a bottle just like Jalen Daniels has been for Kansas, and we're not even throwing them in there. Does that speak to the surprise element of TCU at this point, of Texas at this point, or does that kind of say that we still might have some reservations about K-State because of the two-lane loss? Hmm. Uh, I think part of it is Kansas stole some of their thunder, you know, by as well as Kansas has been playing their first loss last week. But uh, in the state of Kansas, both teams ranked. uh, I read this for the first time. Both of them ranked first time since like 07 right? something yeah yeah I think that's right so uh really good football being played there and it's just sort of to me it's that's sort of Chris Kleiman style also yes. you know it's very uh get the job done uh you know I'm not going to say vanilla but just get the job done no hoopla let's go out there and let's win another game turn the page and go to the next game now Kansas is five and one but We'd be remiss if we said that their Big 12 schedule was as loaded as as Oklahoma's is, as mm-hmm. Iowa State's has been to this point. Um, Kansas, three, two and one in Big 12 play. West Virginia, Iowa State, TCU is the one. And we're talking about TCU as a contender, and they lost to them. Yeah. So you look at the rest of Kansas's schedule as it's laid out in front of them. It's I think they're, they might be off this week. I'm yeah. not 100% not sure. sure. But 
they're here on the 22nd uh and then they have texas left they have texas tech left they have both oklahoma schools left uh this is they're going to and they have the sunflower sh- showdown yeah. on uh thanksgiving week uh this is gonna be an interesting six weeks for the jayhawks yeah very much so i mean uh this is the stretch drive but maybe they built enough confidence you know that that'll propel them into this stretch run second half of the season right. you could say the toughest part of their schedule and i think you'd be right so um be fun to see that and the two trips to texas that they have are in waco and Lubbock, mm-hmm, neither mm-hmm. one of those easy places to play mm-hmm. when those teams are humming, and they're both playing pretty good football right yeah. now. Yeah, homecoming here, uh, the 22nd, which is an 11 a.m. game. Yep. I know you saw that, so yeah, that'll be great. As someone, I, I understand fans don't have the same feelings on it. As someone who works on deadline on game day, 11 a.m. is my favorite kick time. <laughs> I know that. I've come to <laughs> I've come to like 11 a.m. Yeah. more than I used to. Used to be the the worst games got put at 11 a.m. Right. You know, let's bury them here. But now, you know, with Fox and their big noon kickoff mm-hmm. that's noon eastern i mean those are some really and, and espn's balancing that with 11 a.m games there's some big games at 11 a.m and the first conference to really embrace that 11 a.m time slot and put a really good game there the big 12 big 12 yeah and they did that what 2017 2018 yeah. no i think the league was open to it and i think it's paid off and it's shown other leagues hey we have a really good 11 a.m game let's not sh- or we have a really good game let's not shy away from that 11 a.m yeah. time slot yeah All right, let's go into three keys for Baylor this week. Baylor, West Virginia, that's a 6 p.m. Central time kickoff Thursday night. Is it Puskar or Pusker? Uh, Neither. Mylan Pushkar. 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 I don't know how you get that out of the spelling there, but it's Mylan Pushkar Stadium. We'll blame Eastern Europe. There you go. (laughs) I've been saying it wrong my entire life. 6 p.m. Central time Thursday night from Mylan Pushkar Stadium (laughs) in Morgantown, West Virginia. It is the unranked Baylor Bears at Three and two, one and one in Big Twelve play, facing the math. Th- two and two three. And three. Is that right? Yeah. Oh and two. Right. West right. Virginia Mountaineers. Uh, first Thursday night game for the Bears since 2019. Trivia time. Baylor has played three West or three Thursday night games uh-huh. against. Uh, West Virginia. Huh. Not so much a trivia time, just a fun fact. Three. <laughs> Thursday night games in five years, all against West Virginia. Huh, interesting. That's right, because uh, the game in 19 was Halloween. It was Halloween here, here. right? And that and was, it was a Thursday miserably night. miserably cold. Yeah, <laughs> but that was a Thursday night. And West Virginia's playing their third Thursday night game of this year. In six so, weeks. Yeah, yeah. So Insane. they may be used to it. All right, three big keys. We'll start with you. Okay. Um, I think West Virginia is really good, best in the league in third down. No, second best in the league in third down conversions. Okay. They're right at 49 point something percent. So you've got to be able to get off the field on third down. I think that's huge. And, uh, you know, third, third downs, you convert that, you continue drives, you keep the clock going in your favor. So I think that's going to be really, really big if Baylor can stop them on third down opportunities. I'm going with the secondary as my first key. I think that you have to be able to defend the pass, force JT Daniels to make risky throws. Don't don't let the receivers beat you and give up the big play. You've got to force him to thread the needle and try to force a turnover that way because West Virginia is a little bit more reliant on the pass than on the run. Yeah, very good. Second one for me would be Baylor's got to be able to run the ball. I mean, they, uh, you know, they've talked a lot about it. The, the offensive linemen have, the running backs have. Coach Aranda sure has about getting that edge yep. uh, on on offense. And that's not just the offensive line. That's the running backs. It's just an attitude on offense. So they've had extra time to pound that into the guys' heads. So. We'll see how that plays out and how Baylor runs the ball. Uh, My second key is going to be route running. I think that you've got to run clean routes against a team like West Virginia. This defense is really good. Um, Yes, the the offense is mostly centered on JT Daniels, but rightfully so. He's a very good quarterback, and he's kind of earned that right uh, there in Morgantown. You have to be able to run clean routes, give Blake Shapin a place to throw the ball um, to avoid more turnovers. And then whenever you get a throw your way, if you aren't going to be able to make the catch, you have to swat it down. Yeah, yeah. Because there were two, there, one of those two interceptions against Oklahoma State in the fourth quarter was simply because he couldn't make the catch, and instead of swatting it down to keep it away from the defender, he let it play. Yeah. 
It's a great interception, by the way. Yes. Great juggling Remarkable interception. Catch. It really was. All right, third one for me would be handle the atmosphere in Morgantown. It's a Thursday night. Those people will be out there, and, you know, they're going to be ready for Baylor coming to town. Baylor's 0-5 all-time playing in Morgantown. So uh, Baylor's got to handle that road atmosphere, and I think they will. I think they, you know, learn from BYU. They learn some more from Ames, and, uh, you know, hopefully that will pay off on, on you Thursday. Know, you put – you mentioned 0 and 5 in Morgantown all yeah. time. Is this one of the top two teams to ever go to Morgantown for Baylor? Ooh. I'd put it up there with you know 20, 2014. Probably you know 2014. That 2012 team was really good. That was the 70-63 game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, probably so to go up there. Um, this is an awesome atmosphere. I really like that key, and I'm really sad that you stole it from me. You can use that. <laughs> <laughs> My third key is going to be the offensive line, and yeah. not specifically because of the running game. But because how many of those penalties in uh, Provo and how many of those penalties at Ames were pre-snap? Yeah. And those are road atmospheres. This is going to be as hostile an environment as I would think Provo was. Uh, because West Virginia, I mean, I mean this in the most affectionate way possible. These fans are crazy people. And it makes college football a lot of fun, man, <laughs> when you've got an atmosphere like this. Um, I, you, those pre-snap penalties can't be there. You have to, have to, have to watch the ball and not listen for a cadence yeah because that's what leads to that good call and that's kind of a kind of a basic tenant on the road isn't it yep. playing on the road especially in that kind of environment so that'll be important um much cleaner game for baylor against oklahoma state but that was also at home uh iowa state to me is the standard setter for yeah. uh penalties right now for baylor because was that three it, i think it was three three for 30 or something like that yeah. yeah and it showed that they can do it on the road right now you just have to do it on the road again yeah and then after that you have to do it on the road three more times <laughs> exactly um and so i like i like baylor's chances i'm taking baylor in this one uh interested to see by how much yeah i am definitely taking baylor i like neil brown a lot i do do you know this he and i are from the same hometown from danville kentucky and i went to danville high school neil went to boyle county high school oh, wow. which was is the county school there and he was like a five poor sport standout <laughs> all-state receiver when he graduated he was the second leading receiver all time in the state of kentucky so wow he's got i don't think he has a statue there but he should so he should. yeah so we're from uh, the same hometown and i i like him for that reason but i and i want him to do well yeah. but not this week not this week <laughs> your your two favorite teams west er, uh, baylor in West Virginia, but on uh, on that on that day, <laughs> except when we're playing each except other, when you're right? playing each other, yeah, or yeah. whatever team Dan, uh, Neil Brown winds up coaching. Yeah, in, in yeah. he is a very good coach. He's got He's West Virginia moving in the right direction. Yeah, and it does feel like if he can get them to catch on, right. that this might be as sustainable as the Dana Holgerson run was, especially in the middle there. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I, I think he's a very good coach. He's proven that. Uh, I know he and Coach Aranda are really close, very much self-respect or mutual respect between mm -hmm. those two. I mean, they recruited the same areas for how long when Aranda yeah. was at LSU and uh, Brown was at Troy as yeah. the head coach there. Um, you look at the rest of the schedule for this week. So that is the Thursday game again. That is 6 p.m. Central time. And you're going. You'll be there. I'm going. I fly out of Austin at 8 a.m. Thursday. Nice. Chance of rain. Did you see that? I did. Chance of rain on Thursday. So might be a factor. I'll be packing the rain gear for <laughs> sure. I know, I know that our chief photographer, Rocky Bridges, is watching this and making sure that I know to pack it. Uh, uh, three games on Saturday. Kansas not off. Kansas is playing this weekend. In fact, it's one of those in the teeth of their schedule games oh, yeah. that we talked about. 11 a.m. God's Time Saturday on ESPN2, the 19th-ranked Kansas Jayhawks at Gaylord Family Oklahoma Memorial Stadium mm, facing yeah. the 3-3 three and three reeling Oklahoma <laughs> Sooners. This is a fascinating matchup. Yeah, it is. How how about that? You know, like <laughs> like we said last week, there's no way Oklahoma loses three in a row. Yeah. Well, do they lose four in a row now <laughs> against right. Kansas? So yeah, this will be fun to see, and uh, we'll just be. I'll be home on Saturday for the most part, yeah. so I'm gonna sit down and hunker down and watch games like this. What's the biggest key to this one for me? Because uh, for you, because to me, it's just get Dylan Gabriel play because I yeah. don't trust the yeah. Oklahoma defense to get a stop. No, that's really that. That's it, isn't it? I mean, he is such a key to their success and uh, we saw a big zero you yeah. know on their scoreboard on Saturday when he didn't play. Davis Bedville not Dylan Gabriel yeah. that's not his fault he's just a different quarterback right. and then obviously the Jeff Levy and Brent Venable see something that they don't like to where you know if they if Gabriel can't go and they go with General Booty who's the third string quarterback yeah. and first team all name in college football <laughs> right um <laughs> that 
tells me that they don't really know who their second string <laughs> is, and that creates a little bit more confusion on the offense to me. Yeah, and Kansas looking to bounce back, having to go on the road, play in that atmosphere. I'm sure the OU fans, you know, they're going to be, they're going to do their part on Saturday. So it's a great matchup. Some of the projections have Oklahoma as a favorite. I okay. take Kansas. Hmm. Do you really? I'm taking going in there. I don't uh, trust OU to get a stop, and I yeah. don't know what Gabriel's status is. Yeah, that's true. You know, I not knowing Dylan Gabriel, I'd take Kansas also. Yeah, which would be a huge road win. Did you think we'd be here six weeks ago no. when we started this here show? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> uh, also, 11 a.m. Central Time on Saturday from Daryl K. Royal Texas Memorial Stadium in Austin. It is the three and three, also reeling Iowa State Cyclones, who, by the way, they've also lost three in a row. Yeah. And these 22nd ranked four and two Texas Longhorns winners of two in a row with their starting quarterback back. And I think that at this point, it's Quint, the Quinn Ewers show. And how much can Iowa State fluster him? Yeah. Because I think that's the biggest key is Texas has to score to win. When Texas has trouble scoring, even if just for a half, is when it starts having trouble winning. Huh. It's what cost them the game in Lubbock. And it's what kept that UTSA game really, really close for way too long. Um, I like Texas in this one, but Iowa State's defense is good enough to make it interesting. That's it. We talked about Iowa State, how good they are defensively. So, uh, Quinn Ewers, Longhorns offense, they've got their work cut out for them. The final game on Saturday is a 2.30 p.m. Central Time kick, and this is the game of the day in the Big 12 Conference. From Ammon G. Carter Stadium in Fort Worth on ABC, it is the 5-0, number 13, TCU Horn Frogs hosting the also 5-0, number 8, Oklahoma State Cowboys. Oh, what a matchup. Battle of unbeaten. Battle How of about unbeaten In October. Between two of the Big 12's elite. Yeah. <laughs> the two teams. Of, <laughs> uh, that is a realignment joke. Um, <laughs> but what I, TCU's defense, I don't know. They've gotten some good stops when they've needed, uh, but it's the offense that stirs the drink there in Fort Worth for me. Oklahoma State's a little bit more balanced of a team. I'm taking Oklahoma State simply because I've seen more from them. Right. I think they are more tested. I think they have shown to play better football on a broader scale, but I truly don't have a read on this game. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, again, recency bias. I've seen Oklahoma State up close, and I would pick them to win. That's not a knock on TCU whatsoever. I think this could be a great game. You know, isn't it a great game, great showcase for the Big 12? The only thing that surprises me here is a blowout. Yeah, truthfully. yeah, yeah. No, I think it'll be close. Two good teams playing each other. Now, on a little bit of Baylor-related news that came down the pipe yesterday. Yes. Former Baylor football coach Matt Rule fired as the head yeah. coach of the Carolina Panthers, as is his longtime defensive coordinator who went to Temple to Baylor to Carolina with him, yeah. Phil Snow. Obviously, immediately, everybody, myself included, starts saying, look, guys, the rule to the NFL thing didn't work out. But what he's done at the college level, he took a Temple team that's kind of a non-traditional program and turned it around in year three, wins 10 games, wins 10 games in year four. That gets him the job at Baylor yeah. in the midst of a scandal. Goes 1 and 11, installing a defense first t kind of culture. 7 and 6, 10 and 3, he's gone to the NFL. What is it about him at the college level, in your experience with him, that mm. makes it to the point where every single person who understands football and how it works is saying, is, is looking at Matt Rule and saying, look, guys, he's going to get a college job if he wants it. Yeah, if he wants it, that's the key. Right. But he, he's a program builder. I mean, there are some really good, high-profile college jobs that are open right now. Yep. And I think Matt Rule would probably be on every one of their lists. You remember he played at Penn State, so he's yep. got that Big Ten background in Nebraska and Wisconsin have openings right now. Um, but I, I don't know. He hadn't called me. I don't know <laughs> if he, he wants to. He hasn't called me either. Right. I don't know if he wants to stay in the NFL. I would guess that he would, if he mm -hmm. could, would want to stay in the NFL. But, man, he could have almost his pick of jobs in college because your question is, what is it about him? He's a program builder. Yeah. You know, he knows what to do. He's done it at Temple, here at Baylor, uh, in, in really rapid fashion, too. You right. know, you don't have to hire him and think, oh, this is a five-year plan. You know, look what he did at Baylor from one win to ten wins in three. Years. Yeah, and I mean the guy knows football. Yeah. Now there are some things that maybe changed a little bit since he last coached in the college level. One of those being name, image, and likeness. Yeah. And so I look at it as the two places he's been, 
are two that aren't known in football for having, we'll call them pesky boosters. <laughs> like we have 90 minutes down the road if you go south <laughs> on 35 from where we're standing right now. So looking at the jobs that are open, knowing that it's Arizona State, Nebraska, Wisconsin right now in the Power 5 level, Georgia Tech Georgia in the Tech, Power 5 yeah. level as well. Although there's a rumor on Twitter, and I don't know that it has any feet whatsoever, but that because of his friendship with Jeff Collins, who was fired at Georgia Tech, that he might be hesitant to take that one. Okay, Let's look at those four. In 2016, when he was hired at Baylor, Baylor was coming off of a scandal with an NCAA cloud hanging over its head and a whole lot of uncertainty about the football program moving forward. Those three apply to one of those four openings to me. Do you agree? And which one is it to you? <laughs> because when I said that on Twitter yesterday, yeah. people thought I was talking about Nebraska, yeah. and I very much was not. Right, okay. Well, that was my thought when you were saying that. I thought you were talking about Nebraska. I think, here's another thing to factor in, uh, I think the Big Ten tie might be a factor. I agree with you. Uh, and I think Wisconsin e e has been and is a really good job. And remember this also, Marcus Sedberry was here at Baylor mm -hmm. during Cat, uh, Coach Rule's tenure here. Uh, and Marcus is now uh, the deputy AD at Wisconsin. So somebody there is going to say, hey, tell us about Matt Rule. They're going to ask him that question. And I bet he'll have really good things to say about him. So that that's, to me right now, that's the leaning, again, yes. if he wants to go back to college. And we don't know what it is. We don't know the terms of his buyout with the Panthers either. Right, right, right. There is a report from Ian Rappaport of the NFL Network that part of the stipulation of his buyout is it's offset by whatever his new college salary gotcha. would be gotcha. because everybody is just assuming <laughs> he's going to go back to the college game where he had so much success. Right, right. Of those four, and I agree with you that to me, he might lean Big Ten yeah. because most of his coaching experience was in Big Ten country, yep. including in the NFL when he worked with the Giants uh, for the one year. However, if I'm the athletic director at Arizona State University right now, <laughs> I'm ha sliding a blank check across the desk <laughs> to Matt Rule yeah. and his agent and saying, name your price, we'll make it work. Wow. Because Arizona State has an NCAA cloud hanging over its head. Yeah. It's in the midst of scandal because of recruiting allegations during the COVID-19 pandemic. And there's uncertainty about the future of Sun Devil football. Mm. Part of it's because of realignment mm -hmm, in the Pac-12. Mm -hmm. Part of it is just because they've kind of been reeling since the end of the Todd Graham era there in Tempe. I think that that is a very similar situation in Tempe right now to what Rule inherited in Waco in December of 2016. Those are really good thoughts. And if there is any... Uh, anything out there for maybe Arizona State coming this way to yep. the Big 12? Why not hire a guy who had success, coached in the Big 12, kind of knows his way around? Exactly. Yeah, that's a very good thought. So that's my thought on it. I agree with you that if I am Matt Rule, if I'm thinking like Matt Rule, you know, that Midwest, Northeast area kind of looks nice. And if you had to choose between Wisconsin and Nebraska, right now as a college football coach, I'd go Nebraska. Yeah. I'd go, not Nebraska, I'd go Wisconsin. Wisconsin, yeah. yeah Nebraska might have more money. But Nebraska is pretty similar to Texas in its athletic department <laughs> structure, um, to me at least. And I wouldn't want that headache. I'd go to, I'd go to Madison and just start winning. Yeah. Here, here's another idea or thought. Uh, I think Matt Rule would be terrific on TV if he wanted to do TV for a 100%. year. Just collect the money from, uh, you know, from the Panthers and do TV. I think he'd get bored of doing that pretty quick. Yeah. But I think he'd be really good at it. I also agree with you because the man knows some football. Right, right. You excited for Morgantown? Yeah, let's go. Let's do I it. I hope the rain holds off. Uh, me too. You know? I'm hoping it rain during the day. Yeah. Leave my yes, night yes, alone. Yes, let, let yes the exactly. Be let it rain in Waco. Come on. Let's say a <laughs> prayer here. We need rain here in Waco. For John Morris, the voice of the Bears, I'm Curtis Quillen. We will see you Thursday from Morgantown. Enjoy your week. That's been the Big 12 Breakdown.